How you doing? How's everybody today? Nice to be here. I want to ask you a question that I've been asking myself for a while now. And it is a question about comedy, but more specifically, this is a question about political comedy and satire. And it's an important question to me because for the past 33 years, I've been a comedy writer and an editor at Mad Magazine. And during that time, Mad has made fun of six presidents, seven, if you count the occasional Lincoln joke. <laughs> what? Too soon? <laughs> I joined the Mad staff in January 1985. A few months later, Ronald Reagan appeared on the cover of Mad. A number of years later, the first President Bush was in office, and he threw up at a banquet into the lap of a Japanese prime minister, and we thought that would be a good subject for a mad cover. <laughs> we parodied Bill Clinton and Al Gore as deep thinkers of the 1990s. It was not very difficult making fun of President George W. Bush on the cover of Mad, nor was it difficult making fun of his vice president, Dick Cheney. It's not too often a vice president shoots someone in the face and remains in office. President Obama appeared on several mad covers. This was his uh, appearance as candidate Obama. And of course, President Trump. This is one of his two appearances on a mad cover as candidate Trump. Now over the years, MAD has gleefully, gleefully mocked Republicans, Democrats, and third party candidates. And as a MAD editor, I've written jokes about candidates I've voted for, and I've written jokes about candidates I've voted against, and I will tell you, I will admit, it is much more fun writing jokes about candidates I have voted against. But that is not my job. My job is to write the best possible jokes, even if they come at the expense of my candidate. Because the function of satire, the purpose of satire, is to reveal truth, whatever it may be, through comic exaggeration and ridicule. That's what gives satire juice. That's what makes satire so compelling. Here's my question. In the age of Donald Trump, does political satire still matter? And when I say matter, I mean a matter be beyond its inherent entertainment value. Matter beyond its ability to generate yucks. What I mean is, can political satire actually change someone's mind on an important social issue? Can it inspire someone to vote for or against a particular candidate? Or is Donald Trump our first satire-proof president? I want you to think about this. In a relatively short time, just a couple of years really, Donald Trump has become the subject of more satire, more parody, more comic put-downs than any political figure in modern American history. More than George, you're doing a heck of a job, Brownie Bush. More than Bill, I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Clinton. Even more than Dick, I am not a crook, Nixon. As pure comedy fodder, Donald Trump is Richard Nixon squared. True. From the moment he came down the escalator into the pit, of American politics, Donald Trump has been the number one target of the entire American comedy world. In fact, we have been ordered to make fun of him. This has never happened before. We have been ordered to make fun of Donald Trump. Filmmaker Michael Moore said we should fight Donald Trump with an army of comedy. David Letterman said comedians have an obligation to go after Donald Trump. And they have. Letterman's replacement, Stephen Colbert, Trevor Noah, Samantha Bee, Jimmy Kimmel, Bill Maher, of course, Louis Black. Hey, even Louis C.K., 
who is not primarily a political comedian, he compared Trump to Hitler. Plus, there's Saturday Night Live, South Park, Funny or Die, The Onion, and yeah, Mad Magazine. We all took our best comedy shots, and Trump still won. He still won. I got to tell you, as a comedy writer and an editor at a humor magazine, I took Trump's victory as a stinging professional defeat. Not as hard as Hillary, but close. <laughs> now, I, I want to put this in some broader perspective for you, OK? We have had Donald Trump and our comedy crosshairs at MAD long before he decided that he was running for president. We made fun of his ridiculous feud with Rosie O'Donnell. We parodied his asinine television reality show. We depicted him as developmentally challenged. Once he declared that he was running for president as a candidate, we cast him as the leading man in two more Hollywood films, The Toxic Contender and The Great Gas Bag. We showed him on the cover of Deplorable People magazine. We honored him as the dumbest person of the year in 2015. We acknowledged him when he finally admitted that President Obama was a citizen of the United States, just like we acknowledged him when he finally denounced the KKK. None of it seemed to work. It didn't seem to work. I mean, even though Donald Trump uh, is famously thin-skinned and doesn't like being the butt of jokes. Jokes didn't seem to have any impact on his viability as a candidate. What was the reason for this? What's the explanation for this? Here's my theory. I think that political satirists and comedy writers are a lot like talk radio hosts and cable news hosts in that we are Preaching to the proverbial choir. You know what I mean? Just like Sean Hannity's viewers mostly agree with Sean Hannity, John Oliver's viewers mostly agree with John Oliver. Modern media world is completely fragmented. It's, it's fragmented. It's chopped up into, into, into small little bits. And the mainstream media, or what we used to think of as the mainstream media, it's really not mainstream anymore. Not the way it used to be, not in the world where the average person spends a third of their waking hours on a smartphone and over two hours a day on social media. Social media is the mainstream media. It's the media we mainstream. And depending on what poll you believe, 44 to 62 percent of Americans now say they get their news on Facebook. And by the way, I got that news on Facebook. <laughs> With rare exception. We all live in an echo chamber of our own creation, which means if you are a Donald Trump supporter, you live in a media world of other Donald Trump supporters, and you won't find much political satire there. Why? Because political satirists, at least in my lifetime, have almost all been liberal. All of the great ones certainly have from Lenny Bruce and Dick Gregory, right up through George Carlin and Richard Pryor, Trey Parker, Matt Stone, and of course, John Stewart. And listen, don't let anyone ever tell you that Rush Limbaugh is a political satirist. He's not. Or if he is, then Keith Olbermann's a political satirist too, and Keith Olbermann is not a political satirist either. Here's the fact. There's a large segment of America that political, satir, that political satire just doesn't reach. And even if it did, it would be fair to ask, what tangible difference would it make, right? We live in such a, a stubborn world, we all feel it, all of us. Cultural battle lines have been drawn, everyone's opinion seems to have Harden like crazy glue. And honestly, it doesn't feel like there are many minds out there left to influence, let alone change. So in this environment, what's a political satirist to do? 
with the understanding that throwing in a comedy towel is not an option. There is too much at stake. There is a man in the White House with a very big to-do list, and yet he somehow has time to tweet about Arnold Schwarzenegger's sagging television ratings. This is no time for political satirists to throw in the comedy towel or to indulge in self-pity over the limits of our influence. So, when Donald Trump was elected president, political satirists, including us at MAD, we got back to work. First thing we did, we showed our mascot, Alfred E. Newman, responding to Trump's victory. And we called Trump's election the dumbest thing of 2016. We redesigned the presidential seal for our new commander in tweet. Then we did a series of Donald Trump Christmas carols. My favorite was called Build the Wall. Went like this. Build the wall along the border, Trump la 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 la. High and wide, and that's in order, Trump la 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 la. Don't be afraid, please do not panic, Trump la Trump la 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 la. Long as you are not Hispanic, Trump la 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 la. Then we started making fun of Donald Trump's cabinet, his Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos. His Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Ben Carson, who, as you may recall, referred to slaves as immigrants. His Attorney General, Jeff Sessions. His Press Secretary, Sean Spicer. And next, the aforementioned Kellyanne Conway, who he showed in an ad for a new perfume called Alternative Facts. For Valentine's Day, we did Donald Trump candy hearts, which such touching sentiments as, let's do the thing I allegedly did in Russia, and can Steve Bannon watch? <laughs> when the court struck down his Muslim ban for the second time, we had the Statue of Liberty respond on our behalf. When he predictably botched the repeal of Obamacare, we envisioned his next book. And when Nordstrom ditched Ivanka Trump's clothing line, we redesigned their store logo. And here is our current cover. Does any of it matter? Does any of this really matter? Does political satire matter? My answer is yes. I think political satire still matters because when political satire disappears, free speech usually comes next. So it's important that we still have political satire. That said, my biggest takeaway from the election of 2016 was that satirists don't influence the course of nations anywhere near as much as the course of nations influence satirists. It's, a, it's an interesting thing. Even though comedy didn't stop Donald Trump from being elected, it clearly irks him. That's why he ripped Saturday Night Live and Alec Baldwin on, on Twitter. That's why he sued Bill Maher when Bill Maher said that he would donate $5 million to a charity if Donald Trump could prove that he was not the spawn of his mother having sex with an orangutan. So we need to keep making fun of Donald Trump. And with that goal in mind, I want to offer the following advice to my fellow political satirists. Let's stop seeding our comedy ground. Ever since 1968, when Richard Nixon appeared on Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In, political satirists have gotten way too cozy with politicians. Now keep in mind, when Nixon appeared on Laugh-In in 1968, he was candidate Nixon, and that he then went on to win the election. This is a strange but true fact. The socket to me, hippie counterculture of the 1960s actually helped Richard Nixon rise to power. Likewise, when Saturday Night Live invited Donald Trump to be the host, Saturday Night Live helped Donald Trump rise to power. That should never happen again. So here's a message to Lorne Michaels, the longtime producer of Saturday Night Live. Sir, Please stop inviting politicians from either side of the aisle into your comedy kingdom. 
It is not the job of political satirists to cozy up the politicians, make them feel comfortable, or give them an opportunity to show the world what a great sense of humor they have. When political satirists do that, they give their power away. And that brings me to the White House Correspondents' Dinner. I am really glad that Donald Trump has decided not to attend this year. I really am, because the White House Correspondents' Dinner has become yet another unfortunate example of political satirists yielding their comedy ground to politicians. Now don't get me wrong. I like the idea of a president showing up at an event, especially a charity event, to be poked fun at by a comedian. This is actually in the tradition of the king and the court jester. I think it's a noble tradition. There's something healthy about it. But when the court jester is done with his act, the king should not be permitted to play the role of court jester himself. So if a president, any president, insists on playing the role of the stand-up comedian, real stand-up comedians should stay home. I'm going to leave you with one final thought. It's been said, widely said, that Donald Trump never laughs. Well, actually, I've looked into this, and he has laughed at least once that we know of in public in the last year. And it was at a campaign rally. And he was speaking, and while he was speaking, someone in the audience let out an animalistic yowl. And it kind of startled Trump. And from the podium, he said, was that a dog? And someone in the audience yelled back to him, no, it was Hillary. Trump laughed. He laughed at that vile, misogynistic, ugly joke. He finally laughed. And that is one of many reasons that political satirists need to make sure that we keep laughing at him. Thank you very much.